Alan Jackson put it well when he wrote the song and then sang it just a few short days after September 11th. Where were you when the world stopped turning on that September day? So my question to you is, where were you? Where were you when the world literally stopped in so many different levels? It's hard to believe it's been 20 years since September 11th. And we're going to reflect back on those 20 years and, and what happened on that day and the days thereafter and how this really kind of changed the world that we live in today. Well, I'm Susan Littlefield here on the Rural Radio Network, and I'm excited to take you along on this journey of remembering and what we always say, we'll never forget. And joining me is the former governor, former lieutenant governor, and the state treasurer at the time, Dave Heineman. And Dave, I should also add in there, emergency management director at 1.2. But start out September 11th, you were not in Nebraska that day. You were actually attending an event representing the state of Nebraska. Uh, I was at an annual state treasurer's conference, my staff and I, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Two hour difference uh, in terms of the time zone. We were just going down to breakfast about 6.45 in the morning and all of a sudden we heard this commotion. What's going on in New York? Uh, TVs got turned on 17, 18 minutes later. It was the second uh, tower that got hit. I knew instantane instantaneously from my military background we were under attack in America. And I told my staff right away, I said, hey, we're not going to be able to fly back to Omaha where we had flown to, uh, down to Albuquerque. Go see if you can get a rental car and we better figure our way back to Nebraska right away. We got the last rental car out at the airport. Later that morning, we took off for uh, Nebraska. Uh, the Iowa State Treasurer and his deputy went along with us. We drove 22 hours straight all the way back. I remember going by Fort Carson, Colorado. Uh, a major army installation, cars were backed up because obviously they were checking everybody going in. Uh, and during that time frame, as we were headed back to Nebraska, uh, I called Governor Joe Hans, I was calling my staff. I, I was concerned financially, would we be able to operate, because that was my job uh, as the state treasurer. And so uh, again, that was an incredible day, I'll never forget. And, and I'm really grateful to all our first responders and our United States military for all they've done for us. Before we dive into that, I do want to talk about that because on Friday we welcomed one of our own home um, as everything continued to take place in Afghanistan. And as we all know, the last two weeks have been very sad for 13 families and for the 15 that are injured and still trying to recover from that. But Omaha, welcome back. And Nebraska, welcome back, one of their own soldiers. Uh, Marine Corporal Dagan Page, uh, an American hero, uh, he paid the ultimate sacrifice to protect all of us. Uh, a very difficult situation for the family, uh, but we honored him. He was given a hero's welcome uh, in Omaha. I'm very, very proud of his service. And I thank everybody, including yourself, who's had a son uh, serving in the United States Army right now, is appreciative of what our United States military does. They put their life on the line every single day for us. And sometimes we forget that and we should thank them at every opportunity. Very much so. And I think it just reiterates how, you know, even 20 years later, we're still seeing the effects of, of September 11. You know, I remember that day uh, Husker Harvest Days was underway and it was a beautiful day. It, and it sounds like in just all the different things I've read and the videos and interviews I've, I've listened to, everybody said the same thing. The weather was beautiful. There was a news reporter um, who worked uh, for Fox News who was in Florida at the time because he was there with the president. And he said it was a beautiful day. It wasn't humid. The sky was blue. It seemed like the entire United States had absolutely perfect weather that day. And, and I remember, you know, it was right before, you know, 7.59. So it would have been, you know, an hour, the time difference here in, mm -hmm. in Nebraska. But you literally that day could have shot a cannon through the Husker Harvest Days grounds because there was nobody there and everybody was either huddled around radios or huddled around televisions, the big old box TVs that we had to be able to watch what was happening. Well, we all wit witnessed it, uh, watching on TV, listening to radio. Uh, you're right, it was an amazing day, it was a beautiful day. I remember driving back. Uh, the sky was as perfect as it could ever be. And of course, you remember for the first time in the history of America, uh, they grounded every airplane uh, except for the President of the United States. And remember that day, it was a scary day, it was a frightening day because we didn't know what else was going to happen. 
president of the United States wanted to get back to Washington, D.C., and I understood that. But the Secret Service, everybody, they didn't want to bring him back until they were sure it was secure. So where did he go? The safest place mm -hmm. in America to do uh, the communications he needed with his staff was off at Air Force Base, uh, Bellevue, Omaha, Nebraska. You know, and I, I have seen reports of, of other journalists who said, you know, there was no air traffic except for the few fighter jets you would hear coming here and there out of off at Air Force Base. And they said suddenly this huge airplane showed up and it was like, wait a second, that is not any normal airplane, that is Air Force One. And for him to be here and go through a fire escape into a basement to do his work just shows the important role that Nebraska played on September 11th. And, you know, interesting about that day, uh, first of all, I think it was uh, Nebraska media first reported it, uh, and they were surprised as anyone. Secondly, President Bush, as I've read uh, uh, recent articles, uh, said, I didn't even know this underground facility existed at off of the Air Force Base and the capability that it had so that he could interact with his cabinet and his National Security Council. They made a lot of decisions, then ultimately, uh, a couple hours later, he headed back to Washington, D.C. to address the nation. And that address, uh, I remember sitting, we were eating dinner and they had brought TVs into the restaurants and everybody stopped eating. And you could hear every so often, you know, kind of the, the quiet cry and, and the sniffles. And it was probably one of the most moving speeches I've ever heard from a president. I, I think you're exactly right. And then the other one I think we all remember is when he went up to New York City and Ground Zero and when he said, you know, the rest of the world is going to hear from us, and they did, uh, that was a very difficult time frame for us uh, as the United States. And as you mentioned, I remember three weeks after 9-11, uh, Dave Marstead, who was the lieutenant governor at the time, took a job with the Bush administration, and Governor Johans asked me to become the lieutenant governor and said, really, the only thing I want you to worry about now is to be the director of Homeland Security. And every day, that's what we focus on. I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to kind of speed up into that and look, because you came back to Nebraska from, from your meeting in New Mexico and obviously continue your job as treasurer, but every morning, everybody woke up wondering, is there going to be another attack today? But what I'm excited about having you join us today and for our listeners and our viewers is to kind of reflect on what those three weeks leading up to when you took over in Homeland Security for the state of Nebraska. Well, first of all, I was just concerned about our ability to uh, do our normal financial business, how it was going to affect financial institutions. But every day, uh, we forget. Uh, you, you came to work and you were nervous. W was there going to be another attack? Where was it going to be? And of course, we were concerned out here in the Midwest, if you really want to disrupt America, go attack uh, uh, small communities, mm -hmm. medium-sized communities out in Nebraska, Kansas, Iowa, or somewhere like that. And then I became uh, Lieutenant Governor and as Director of Homeland Security because we only had an office of Homeland Security at the national level at that time. Then it became the department. But I remember every day we would get these unclassified intelligence reports from uh, the Office of Homeland Security. And I, I would share those with everybody who would give me their email address, the police chief, fire chief, uh, emergency management, public health districts, the hospitals. Uh, we wanted everyone to be aware of what was going on. And I would read those every day, knowing what was going on in America, across the world. And again, we were very, very concerned about what would happen in Nebraska because we had some critical infrastructure. Uh, remember at that time, you had off at Air Force Base, we all know about, uh, two nuclear power plants. We have extraordinary communications facilities uh, out here in Nebraska, in the heartland uh, of America. And we were concerned too, what if those were attacked? And then one that uh, I remember that we spent a lot of time on that affects our number one industry, agriculture. Well, how would we respond if they tried to infect the food supply, all the feedlots, a couple of them across Nebraska? And I remember we were told, we went through several exercises, that literally you had to make decisions within 24 hours without all the information you needed uh, or that uh, disease would spread throughout the food supply all across America. And so I was really proud of our farmers and ranchers and everybody in the ag, uh, agriculture community, how well they responded to this, increased their security uh, at those feedlots all across Nebraska. So as you stepped into that role with in Homeland Security and still working your regular job as a Lieutenant Governor, how did that kind of reshape 
your thinking process of everything that was happening locally, nationally, and globally? Well, I was concerned, uh, again, remember at that time, uh, they aren't going to stop with just one attack. The question was when and where and when would it come uh, to America next? And so every state was just like Nebraska thinking, well, hey, it could be us. And so uh, I, I'm really proud of our first responders and everybody involved in, in, in emergency management. Uh, we were on a heightened state of awareness, and I mean a real heightened state of awareness. Uh, we were at a high alert status, the United States military, because, again, we didn't know what was going to happen next. And it put a different perspective on, on your life. I mean, we're concerned about our families and everything else that's going on. I remember, it was football season. I remember this. We had a lot of discussions. Well, if they were willing to try to fly into a couple towers, what would we do if they tried to fly into Memorial Stadium or some other football stadium? And as you may recall, they started issuing alerts, so particularly on Saturdays, you couldn't get anywhere near a football stadium. So we took all sorts of precautions. Uh, and as we went further down the road, there were attacks that were prevented. Uh, we're a lot stronger today, uh, but I will tell you, uh, the terrorists, particularly over there in Afghanistan, uh, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, they still want to attack America. They have a different value system. You know, we believe in freedom and liberty and economic opportunity, that all men and women are created equal. They have an entirely different culture. And so, again, I think we ought to be on a more... Uh, state of alertness than we've ever had, uh, say, in the last few years uh, because of 9-11, 20th anniversary, what they might try to do. Yeah, it's been on everybody's minds as we continue to, to reflect on, on the what-ifs. and the. But I think we're better prepared, too. We've learned what happened, um, and we know that there were some briefings that were happening that day, that morning, in Washington, D.C., talking about al-Qaeda and what could happen because this September 11th is kind of the the big stamp date but this right. stuff leading up to it happened two years before when those videos started coming out of Afghanistan talking about the need to attack America and to attack and it mentioned air ground I mean it listed everything and the ways that they could do it and uh, then to see it happen that day as they had planned it and planned it very very intensely uh, Susan, you're exactly right. This has been years in the making. And think about it, it, it wasn't like an old war where, you know, guns and bullets and all of that. Uh, they flew aircrafts into two towers. And so now all of a sudden we had to start thinking about readjusting our mindset, how they could attack America. And we still need to be prepared for that today. But you're also right. Uh, we strengthened our, our defenses. We strengthened our critical infrastructure. Uh, I think today, more than ever before, we've got to be concerned about what if they take down communications uh, infrastructure? Uh, what if they attack the electrical grid, the financial grid? Uh, think about how difficult it would be for all of us if we weren't connected to our cell phones and their ability to text each other, to email each other. Uh, and again, we're better prepared than ever before. But again, uh, I'm just nervous. Uh, we're a very open country these attacks could occur anywhere in America. Do you know off the top of your head how many Nebraskans, um, firefighters, EMT, paramedics, law enforcement that made their way to New York City when initially they were looking for that help to help relieve the stress of, of those New York firefighters and, and others? I, I don't know the exact number. I recall that we did send people back there. Uh, America's always been good with the 50 states. When someone needs help, uh, we're there to help them uh, in the case this particular instance in New York City. But you know, the same thing happens. You're a volunteer firefighter. You know what happens when we have a fire in, in North Central, Western Nebraska. Uh, we'll get people from Colorado, Montana, South Dakota, the federal fire uh, workforce coming in to assist us. So we're all there for each other. And again, I think all across America, people came uh, to help uh, the citizens of New York. We were very united uh, that day and and for months uh, after that. Too bad that feeling hasn't continued. I don't want to get, get political on that, but that feel that we had those days, weeks, and months after that. I, I remember sitting September 12th at Husker Harvest Days and a bunch of firefighters I knew stopped by our booth and said, hey, we're going to New York City tomorrow morning, eight o'clock. And I said, sign me up. 
I'll get all my stuff done and I'll go. And they all laughed at me. And I looked at them and said, what's so funny? And they pointed to my belly. I was seven and a half months pregnant at that point, <laughs> And I forgot in that moment that I was even pregnant. All I wanted to do was grab my bunker gear and go to New York City and help. But you know what? What you said is exactly what most Americans were thinking. How could we help? Regardless of our personal circumstances, we wanted to help New York City. Uh, and we didn't know where else it was going to come. And so, again, we were united. I wish we were as united uh, today as we were then. But again, when it comes to the national security of this country and the national defense, we ought to be very, very proud of the men and women serving the United States military, uh, the first responders, the bioterrorism unit we now have at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. There are all sorts of things that we did to strengthen our defenses, uh, but we need to continue to be on alert. Have you seen, I mean, you talk about that strengthening that we've seen. What was the biggest growth that you saw in security of the United States post 9-11? I think a recognition by uh, businesses, individuals, that we need to think uh, more about security in every walk, in every aspect of our life. I mean, we didn't think about feedlots prior to that being uh, a, a terrorist opportunity. And we did after that. And so you had, uh, I would say, big fig lots, particularly put in security monitoring uh, devices. We took extra procedures regarding our critical infrastructure, whether it was a nuclear power plant or a communications infrastructure. I remember uh, we were in constant communication with Offutt Air Force Base. That, uh, it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that was a target of, uh, of opportunity, but they're very, very secure. And the men and women serving at, at Offutt every time I went up there, I was so proud of it. Uh, all those men and women for what they were doing. And, and again, you know, sometimes we forget these were all 18, 19, 20, 21 year old uh, young kids. And boy, they grew up in a hurry. And all those kids that joined thereafter because they felt that draw and that need to, to show up at the recruiter's office and say, sign me up, I'm ready to go. Uh, you saw it all across America. We saw it uh, in, in Nebraska. Uh, I remember uh, years later, you probably remember this, when I became governor, I remember back in probably the 2007-2008 time frame, uh, we had our National Guard, uh, literally all of them deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan, and it seemed like almost every month for about 14, 15 months, I, I went to a funeral of mm -hmm. one of our young soldiers, men and women both, who had died uh, preserving freedom, fighting for our country. And in every town, almost all of them were small towns, uh, they had to go to the high school gym or someplace because everybody turned out to pay their respects, to say how proud they were of those men and women. Yep. And I remember talking to the moms and dads, and what do you say? All I could say is thank you. And they would hug me, and they would say, you know, this is what our son or our daughter wanted to do. They wanted to serve our country, and so they were very, very proud of them. Brian, uh, most of our listeners know that my son serves in the U.S. Army right now, active duty, and he made the comment to me when I talked to him earlier this week. He goes, Mom, I've got young men that I'm in charge of that only know about September 11th because they've read it in the history books or they've seen the documentaries on TV. He says, but the passion is still there, and you know that these kids want to continue to serve because they've heard the stories and they've witnessed what has happened. You know, a lot of the young men and women serving in the United States military, think about it, this is 20 years ago. They weren't even born then. Right. But the passion, the understanding, uh, the fact they've probably seen uh, many different uh, uh, videos about what occurred, uh, they're trained to respond in these very difficult set of circumstances, they appreciate what America went through and they're prepared to do their duty today to protect America. How did September 11th change Dave Heineman? Uh, I became a lot more aware of circumstances around me than ever before, particularly uh, as I would drive into a community, I would drive down the interstate in Nebraska. I looked at uh, the opportunities for terrorist attack much differently than I did before. And again, I was kind of proud of the fact, you know, I graduated from West Point, I served five years in the United States Army. That, those experiences helped me in terms of homeland security, understanding the role, what the military would, would play, what police, fire, emergency responders, first responders, uh, the help we needed from our public health districts and, and, and our hospitals. 
Uh, but it changed the way I looked at things because before I, yeah, I was just a happy Nebraskan, uh, proud of our state, all the great things we do. And then all of a sudden I had to have a more keen and watchful eye. Well, what could happen? And we needed to be prepared for us. That's what they expected us to do as leaders. And again, I just got to tell you, there's so many people I met in police and fire departments, firefighters, uh, police personnel, uh, all these first responders. They went to work and, and, and they did their part to prepare a David City or a Rising City or a Holdridge or McCook to be better prepared. As we get ready to wrap this up, and we've kind of been reflecting on this last 20 years, where we were and where we've come to, have you had the chance to go to New York City and stand where the towers were? Uh, no, I haven't, but I've watched plenty of video. I've talked to uh, a, a number of friends that I know uh, in New York City. I was in an event last week here in uh, Omaha uh, where a firefighter from New York City, originally from Iowa, was there in their fire department for 30 years, uh, now moved back to the Midwest, relived that day. He was actually, that was supposed to be a day off, but he knew right away mm -hmm. he needed to report for duty, and he shared with us what happened. And everybody there was focused on their duty. They, those that went into those towers knew they might not come back alive, and yet they did it to help save as many Americans as they could. Back in uh, 2015, I had the opportunity, I was there with Farm Broadcasters. And so we had an evening and we walked down and I stood in front of Engine 10, the um, truck bay doors, it's now a museum, but it was kitty corner from where the tower stood. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine took a picture. I was wearing my Rising City Fire Department shirt. And she said, why do you keep moving? And I said to her, I said, I feel like I'm not here alone. I feel I'm the only person standing here, but you just felt the presence of those firefighters and those EMTs and paramedics and, and law enforcement that put their life on the line. I wear a bracelet um, that says uh, Lieutenant Greg Atlas, mm -hmm. FDNY Engine 10. And he obviously perished in the towers when they came down. But it was the most, I can't even describe the feeling. I mean, you just knew. And you felt their passion and their desire to, to protect this country. Susan, I think what you felt is exactly what a lot of uh, veterans feel when they go to the Vietnam uh, Veterans mm -hmm. Memorial Wall or World War II, World War I, whatever it may be, and they look at all of those names, the men and women, many are relatives, family members who served our country. Well, that's exactly that same feeling that we have for our police officers, our firefighters, uh, everybody involved who's doing their part to protect America, and we still need to do it today. Well, very well put. We will wrap it up there. Thank you so much for coming and sharing those days and weeks after with us. You're welcome. Joining us has been Dave Heineman. As we look back on this 20th anniversary, you're going to be hearing a lot more over the days to come as folks reflect and you see the stories not only on your television but on your radio as well. Thanks for joining us. I'm Susan Littlefield.